All right, guys, uh, let's start course. See, um, my name is Machina Tai. Uh, Jim and Hugo will be having uh, me, and you will be taking this course. Hugo will take care of the workshop part, and me. I will be mostly uh, available for you to ask questions. If you've got questions, just raise your hand. Um, so, let's start. Hugo, Thank you. Uh, developing apps with IPFS APIs. We want to think about using IPFS as a building block in your application. And we got an application right there. It's a very simple application. It shows you gears that are connected, that has, have this page loaded. And you get some files, you get pictures, you get some data about each. Uh, Year that connected to that board. So how do we build uh, a simple app like that? Uh, so the goal of that small sandbox application is to build a basic understanding about IPFS in apps. And to do that, we, we need to be able to answer basic questions like where to run it. Is, J is IPFS running on that page? Or is it running somewhere else? And we talk to it by some means. What to run? Is it JS IPFS? Is it Pro IPFS? Is it a client of some API? How to talk to it? Is it embedded node that we talk using programmatic interface? Or is it a remote node that we talk to over HTTP API? Finally, how do we store data? How do we add a picture to IPFS? And how do we get it back when someone else is publishing? And speaking about publishing, when people want to publish a picture and then we publish another one or change the description, how do we track updates? And we will be using IPMS for that. Let's talk about provisioning, which is basically a fast way of talking where to run IPFS. There are two high-level patterns when you want to use IPFS in your apps. Every app has a variant of one of those two. First one is where your application is embedding API client. So your app does not have IPFS inside. <coughs> your IPFS is running somewhere else. It could be the same machine as a separate process or a separate, separate user in the security sandbox or a remote node somewhere in the cloud infrastructure, and your app talks to the IPFS node over that API. Second pattern is when your app and IPFS node are one and the same. Your app embeds IPFS node and is effectively part of this world. Let's talk about IPFS as a backend service. When you run IPFS as a backend service, it acts and behaves basically as any other Service you to run your cloud infrastructure, your database, log balancer. You can self host it. You roll your own infrastructure by installing GoIPFS. You can pick pre built binaries or build full sources. There is also Docker image. Uh, if you have bigger needs, such as your data set does not fit on a single node, or you want more advanced uh, features for managing uh, insets. You want to ensure there are multiple copies across multiple uh, nodes. Then you want to deploy IPFS cluster on top of Go IPFS nodes. Uh, that will give you more advanced features. And we don't we won't go into that because there are entire courses on this today. So if you are interested in deploying IPFS infrastructure based on Go IPFS, uh, Go to Electric E. It's today, after this course. And also, uh, if you want to learn more about IPFS cluster, there's Electric E, entire course about this. And they, I did they have a pretty good visual demo, so make sure to check this out. Of course, you don't need to run your own infrastructure. You can pay or use someone else's. <coughs> and uh, there are cloud providers that give.
there are cloud providers that uh, give you some uh, either free access to free services such as cloud or gateway, gateway or uh, basic cleaning services when you get some free space to experiment and then you can decide do you want to continue paying, paying people or run your own infrastructure and even Microsoft provides uh, privacy-centric uh, version of IPFS, which you can create an embedded a private swarm. Um, so you can run it on the cloud, but also you can embed IPFS inside of your node, and it will ship with your app. We can embed Go IPFS. An example of that is IPFS Desktop Local Bazaar. They technically they run a local node and dot and the app talks to it over the API, but it's like, in practice, it's effectively embedded. Textile Photos is a good example of a mobile app which embed, uses embedded Go IPFS, and there's an entire elective team about building distributed apps with Textile SDK. And of course, you don't need to embed an entire Go IPFS binary. You can make your customized build, and there's a pretty cool example of IPFS Lite, which can be used for fetching, just fetching some blocks and putting some blocks on the network without any additional features. You can also embed JSIPFS, and you can embed it in any web browser, in any web context. That could be a web browser, that could be Electron app, or just a node application. When you run it in a web browser, you need to understand limitations uh, around transports and discovery methods. I think core course B covered a little bit of that. But for this uh, ex exercise, especially for that app that we'll be building, we need to understand that there are differences in transports available for JSIPFS and GoIPFS. For JSIPFS, there are differences between JSIPFS running in a web browser and running in Node. So if you run Node or Go version, you have access to TCP transport. However, in browser, it's impossible to establish TCP connections. We use WebSockets in that context, and luckily you can enable it in Go after setting up certificates. So that way you get a full transport coverage across both implementations in all three runtimes. So WebSockets are a good default. Uh, WebRTC lets you establish direct point-to-point -point connections between browser and nodes, and there's work in progress for Go. <coughs> and also Go has a quick tra experimental quick transport that you can enable and uh, play with. We hope to see something here for browsers, maybe related to WebRTC at some point, but this is the current state. WebSockets are probably the same default for now. What are other differences? Uh, there's a lot, however, the takeaway for, from this basic course is that you use Go IPFS in backend uh, contexts when performance uh, or additional features need for you, are meaningful for you. JS IPFS is a default choice in web browser and uh, anywhere where you do would work with JS uh, or, or don't need uh, one of those additional features. There's a huge interval between both, the, the protocol level, the API is the same, Transports overlap uh, in multiple contexts, and local discovery works as well. And soon we will have DHT. For now, JSIPFS does not have a DHT. That is why during the course you will see how we are using the signaling server to work around that to discover each other. Let's talk about APIs. IPFS comes with uh, IPFS command line interface, which is IPFS command. And you can use it for interacting with your local nodes. And during this course, we will use some of those commands. The list is much longer, it did not fit on the screen. However, the same API is exposed over HTTP. So that means when you start IPFS daemon, it will announce itself on multiple ports for other nodes to connect. And it will also open an HTTP port with API. There's a separate port with gateway, which you can think uh, about like a read-only simplified safe uh, API. We will talk about gateway later. So uh, 
uh, I won't go into that. I will just show this simple example. You got a IPFS command executing ID, which will return you basic information about your node, your peer ID, your addresses. You execute that like this, and it will show you details about your local node. However, IPFS command is also a HTTP client for our API. So you can point it at any other API endpoint that it, and it will execute the command there. It's a HTTP client. So you don't really need to use this command if you don't want to. You can use any HTTP client as long as you ask the proper path and the proper port. You can use it. I think there was a faster session yesterday. Um, and that, that, those constructs uh, give us an uh, interesting uh, possibilities. So let's say you have uh, IPFS running uh, somewhere in the cloud infrastructure here. And your app is connecting to it over API, HTTP API, and connection breaks. What happens then? You can build fallback, fallback when your app automatically spawns embedded JS IPFS and continues to <coughs> uh, in seamless fashion. And an example of that is IPLB Explorer. It's at Explorer IPLB IO. It's a simple application. It does not care about identity of your node. You just want to get some logs from the network uh, and show them to the user, which is a pretty cool uh, demonstration of this. Uh, it tries to connect to local uh, API if you are running it and you allow it to connect. If not, it will transparently fall back to embedded JS IPFS and you would still be able to access the same assets and explore them. And now we are moving to the demo application and the practical part of our course, and Hugo will tell you all about that. Hi everyone again. So let's try to build a demo app. It will be something like what you see on that screen, uh, and we'll be doing some light coding. It will be really simple. Uh, we'll we have like six exercises until, and the last one will have the full app working. Hopefully, everything goes well. So I'm going to ask you to get the template for the demo app. Go to this uh, URL. You will have there um, a link to a GitHub repo, and I want you to clone that repo and basically uh, run npm start and open also your text editor on that folder. You also have the link up there. And then if you have any question at any point, just raise your hand. Data I want uh, the, that everyone um, has. It's basically this one: a browser with um, with a web app loaded, and then the other side, your text editor on the first exercise. So, if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and we will help you. to do npm start and get to this page. Yeah, everyone? No one needs help? Got it? Yeah? Cool. So let's go into the first exercise. So what we are going to do now on exercise number one is basically connecting using the API. Using our HTTP client, we'll connect to a remote node. 
we have one running right here. Jim is running it on his laptop. And we, the important bits here is that basically we have a, a daemon running, we have an HTTP API, and we have got to connect to this address. So let's try to do it. We have some, also some resources with the documentation for the HTTP API and also for the client itself. Okay, so the, the exercise is really simple. This first exercise basically is already uh, done for you, but how this works is it, it's basically like this. We'll have, you will have some comments on every file like this one. We have to-dos, to-dos, and to-dos, three on this file. And below each to-do, you will always have a link. This will take you to the documentation, so you can look a little bit to it, into it, and basically uh, what we need to do is copy-paste whatever is in the documentation, just, just so you get the feel about uh, how this works and how that our documentation works. On this one, the first to do is to tell us to add a script that load, load, loading the HTTP client that basically loads the browser bundle for the, the client. And that's all in that here. But if you go to the link, you'll get instructions to do exactly the same. And on this one, the second to do, what we, what, what we need is to connect to that link. So, here, we still need to do something because this IP and this port is wrong, right? That's not the same as you can see on the other screen. So let's try to change the IP and change the port and see what happens. Let's click on exercise one, exercise one, right over there. And then let's change the IP. The port is also wrong. So to this one. And you save it, should reload. And yeah, we have <clears throat> what we need. So the last to do of this exercise is to use it to be client to find the remote de demon ID. So basic ID, some, uh, it's some basic information, the address the demon is listening on, the ID, the public key, the agent, the protocol, and stuff like that. We also have the documentation, and we call the command like this. You can use callbacks or promises, and it's really, really simple. Anyone has uh, any questions for this first exercise? Everyone did it? What, um, what is this um, IP address for? I mean, is something wrong with using your local host host? Sorry, what? Is there anything wrong with using local host? We are connecting to a remote host. So you want to, what's, what's your question? Why do we have to use that particular address? Because that's the idea of our demon. Oh, okay, so you want to uh, connect to your own demon? Yes. It depends on your use case, so you can do. Do you know how to set the course headers on your Go demon? No, you want me to explain it to you? Yeah. Okay, so if you have, uh, we can continue that conversation after. So, uh, let's go into the second exercise, which is basically doing the same thing, but using the embedded um, JS um, daemon. We will be replacing the HTTP client uh, with the embedded JS FPFS. We have some resources if you want to look at it. Or we can just go into the exercise number two. You can always go back if you click on the title. You can go to the exercise number two. And we. And you go to the second file which is called embeddedapi.html. 
So exactly like the first exercise we have to introduce, we have some links to the documentation, and this one is not uh, already filled. So we need to do it. So the first one, you already saw how, how that works. You need to go to that link and get the, the URL to create the script type on the first one, right up there. Go to the link and get the, um, the URL to the, to, to the browser window. Copy paste it into the file and then we will go into the second to do. Now we have the script tag. Again, if you have any problems doing any of the to-dos, just raise your hand and we will help you. So we get the script tag. After this, we need to go to the second to-do, which is basically initializing and, and configure the JS daemon. Here we have uh, one big difference between the client and the daemon. Uh, because in this exercise we are running the full node inside the browser and we have some limitations in transport to the browser so we need to use a signaling service so the browser can talk to the network uh, and as, as you can see we have a little package called WebSocket Start that basically does signaling so the, each browser connects so it knows about other peers in the network and we need to use this one in the configuration, as you will see in a bit. And this one is run by Jimpig right over there in his house in Vancouver. So the point here is that anyone can run these signaling services. And it's easy to do. There's not much logic inside of it. So it's a really simple. So let's go into the second to do. We have two links here. Let's Click on the second one because it explains to you both initializing and configuration. So right here, we have configuration to the signaling service. And you can just copy it over here. We're not going to use this one. We're going to use Jimpix. We save it. And we can already see peers. So we are connected to the network. Anyone needs help? No? Follow uh, the code or look at the, the screen to just copy what's written in the screen. If you didn't connect to the signaling server, would you not be found or not find others or both? Uh, so if you, if you didn't do that and you ran a swarm peers, you would get an empty list? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, there's no, no, no transports if that's allowed to do in the stack to the browser. Even if you think about like where to see it, the, 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 the protocol itself, maybe signaling service, so you after can upgrade to the effect of connection. We have the same problem in IPS or in P2P in this case. There's just no like this. We only have web sockets or web RTC, and if you don't know where to connect, you can't even announce yourself. Like, I'm here, 
And so the next one, there's nothing in the browser. There's different than the document. Okay, guys, let's while MyLMG help out, let's do the last step, which we can actually just go to exercise number one, copy, because it's exactly the same thing as the same API, it's the same interface, go to the second one and just paste it in here, and hopefully we'll get something there. Yeah, cool. So we have another different difference here, which is this event, right? On the HTTP client, there was no event because we, are, we were connecting to a remote server. The remote server is already running. It's already started accepting connections and announcing itself in the network, and everything is already running. In the browser, when we run a full node, a full JS node, we need, in the beginning, we need to, to wait a little bit before calling commands. Actually, this command doesn't actually need to wait for this event, but just for the purpose of explaining how the complete API works. Normally, we need to wait for this event, just to make sure that uh, the network layer is initialized and at least we are making the first connections and the, the first discovery of new peers in the network. Okay, are we golden to now? Yeah, you managed? Nice. So, IPFS, right? It's a file system. And being a file system, we should be able to work with some data, with some files and stuff like that. So, that's what we're going to do in the next exercise. Um, we have the files API, which is basically IPFS add, IPFS cat. Uh, yesterday, you had some courses that hopefully uh, explain, explain to you how this stuff works. And you're going to use that, the, the first API, but for more complex structures, you can also use the, use the DAG API. The DAG API uh, is basically IPLE. I don't know if you know what IPLE is. There's been uh, some post sessions yesterday. There's going to be a deep dive today. But yeah, we're not going to go into it, but it's there. You can learn more about it. You can ask us after about it. So let's go into an exercise about adding files. How adding files works? You basically run <coughs> an IPFS add command which works in the terminal, works as an API. You can use HTTP client, uh, several ways to use the same interface. And if you add a file, you get a CID, a content identifier, right? And if you run the API, you get the same thing, plus a name, plus a size. There's a documentation here. Let's try to do it in our, in our exercise. Challenge three. And basically, in the challenge three, the only thing we're going to need is that first line. So as I told you, this accepts callbacks or promises. And when you use promises, you can also use a single wait. If you know about JavaScript, if you don't, no worry. It's really simple. You only need to uh, copy that line over there to get the CID. So let's try to do it. Let's go back. Let's go into exercise number three. Let's get the third file, which is named add file. And as you can see, everything you did before is already there. Uh, and you don't need to worry about it. You have the script tag, you have the single service, everything but the node is already configured. You have the ready events, and now we only need to care about this part. So again, to do link for the documentation. Go into the documentation, and let's figure out how to add files.
the documentation explains what can, you can input. You get all the options, uh, lots of information. And also, right here, you get some examples and how to add files, right? So the line we need is this one. Let's copy it. Right. Right here. And if you look to the into the documentation in this part, this is how the output looks. So it's always an array with all the, the, the files that the, the CID points to. Can be just one, can be multiple ones. Uh, so we get an array. So we need to to assign uh, this value to the CID, right? So we have the results. You can uh, you can see it in the console log if you want. Just don't forget to add the S or remove the S. Let's, let's make sure it's right. And now, if you go back to our little, little app here, we need to do results. We have an array, we want the first one, and we want the hash, CID. If we save it, hopefully, what's wrong? Can you figure out what's wrong? I forgot to tell you about something. So I just copy paste it. That's exactly the problem with copy paste. Some typos, right? Our input's got file. We have files here. And I want to tell you a little bit about file. That file there is a DOM uh, file object. And we also support it directly here. So we know we don't need to go around and transform your your files if you are doing uh, an upload thingy like we are doing now. So let's just remove here. Okay. And let's try to add the file. Okay. And we get the CID. Right? Can you follow? Do you have any questions, any problems? Raise your hands. Just try to follow the coding screen. Yeah, go into the editor. Let's figure out what's around. Okay, so now let's go into reading files. It's basically the same thing, but in reverse, right? We have a simple command, I can just cat, point intended with rest of the cat. Uh, and if we already added a file, we get a CID and we pass the CID to the cat command. And we get the file back. Same thing using the HTTP API. Or, as we're going to use in the browser, calling the programmatic interface. Also, there's another option to load uh, content. Uh, when you run your daemon, you can see that this line over here, which is uh, the gateway. The gateway allows us to easily, it's a, a read-only API, just to load them, nothing else, just to load the content. If you know the CID, you can use uh, this uh, the IPM port, and you can build your URL, basically IP port, uh, slash IPFS slash CID, and you can see uh, whatever the content inside the file. And you can just load it in the browser. Just like that. So let's go into challenge four. 
And yeah, again, the only thing we are going we need is that line over there, nothing else. If you want to see the docs, go to the docs down there. Let's try it. Let's go back again. Is the size four? Okay, so let's try to do this 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 one. We have uh, in this one we have an extra step that actually doesn't doesn't have a comment or a to do it. Right up there, we have something related to the gateway, as you can see. And here we are going to try to load the image from our local demon and directly from the gateway. So. Hopefully, you already know how to build a URL for uh, loading the content from the gateway. You have the host name over there on the HTTP gateway variable. And let me just point here. The CID will be here. So here, we need to build the URL for our content. So let's use this, do this, do this. So here we have the host name already filled in for us. And what, what we need is basically slash IPFS. And the CID, nothing else. Right? So, As you can see, everything is in there. Let's try to see if we can just load. So we did the same as last exercise. We added the file. Now let's try to load it directly. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. Oh, nice. Let's see. And close, but we're still missing something. We need to load it from our replay, right? And you can go into the, the link and see uh, the options and how, it, how the cat command works. We're going to do it really quickly here. It's just as the one before cat, we need to send it, send it to CID. Save it, and hopefully it will work. Right? Okay, so... Did you manage to follow up until this point? Can you load the, the both images? Sometimes the gateway takes a little, bit, a little bit longer because you need to figure out how to get to because the, the gateway, as you can see, is a public, uh, our public gateway, actually when it loads this image, it first needs to go into the browser, the index DB of the browser, get all the blocks for that image, and then send us back the image. So it do, does the full circle. So. Okay, no, no questions, no problems. Don't need help to get to this point. All good? Yes? Cool. So now we need a way to track updates by naming things, right? Of course we need. So this take, it takes us to IPNS. We need a, a, a static name to the content path. IPFS is immutable. So if we change the content, this CID will always be different. So if you want to do the OCR website in IPFS or something like that, if you didn't change anything on your site, the CID changes. So how can we like 
maintain a static name or a static pointer to our content. We're not going to like hand out CIDs every time we change our website, right? So we have a naming system. IPNS, basically, we get IPNS slash our, uh, the hash of our public key, which is basically a pointer to our content. You can also have readable names uh, using DNS links, so we don't use any hash, any hash uh, and you can also get to, to the content. The API looks like this. <coughs> it's named publish. When you publish, you want to publish a CID and you get back uh, IPNS path with the key ID. So this one is the multiple one, right? The CIDs and IPFS are multiple, IPNS is multiple. Basically a multiple pointer with multiple content. And we, when you want to resolve, you try to resolve your key, your key ID, and you get back the CID. So what about, like, we, I want to publish different things, because this, this key here, by default, if you don't set up anything else, is the key for your IPFS instance. When you initialize your IPFS instance, you, it creates a, a, a pair of keys, and this one, without any further setup, is that is the key, is the hash for that key, for the, that public key. So we need, to, we are going to want to make more than one thing, right? So we have an API for that. We can generate several keys. We can name those keys, and then we, when you publish, you just pass in the name. And you can do multiple publishes, and you can have uh, key pairs associated with each of the pointers to the content. So let's see if we manage to, um, we also will have deep dives on it today about it. So if you want to learn more about it. Challenge number five, updating a multiple pointer with IPNS. So again, really easy. Just the only thing we need is that line over there, nothing else. Let's go again into the exercise number five. Okay. As you can see, everything that we did until now is here. Right now, the only thing we care about is the, this last part. Right to follow on your editors, we all need this part. As you can see, we're gonna call the publishing part. So what we need here uh, is to publish, and we, we need to publish the CID, and this CID will be in this variable. So we need to run the command, pass in the CID, and see what, what happens. You have the link, you can go and check the, the documentation. I'm just going to run the command, publish, get the CID. Okay. So the output for the, the publish command is an object with a, a, a key name and another key value. And that is exactly what we need for this last part. This is the output we, that we want. We want to build this string with, uh, with the name, which is our IPNS key, and the value, which is our CID. <coughs> so I'm going to do some structuring in JavaScript. If you don't know what this is and worry about it, it's not the point of this talk to teach about. JavaScript. You could just copy what's on the screen. Okay, we saved it. Okay, so now we're gonna do 
all the steps again. And uh, the objective at the end is that we upload our avatar here. We can see the avatar we just uploaded, and then we're gonna build our profile. We're gonna write our names here. We're gonna get the CID for the avatar in this box. We're gonna copy paste here. We can write something about us here, and then we're gonna add everything to the to IPFS. This this form creates creates a little JSON, and then we add the this JSON itself. And after that, we're gonna publish. And when we publish, the we will show up here, right? Because this is the list the list of beers. And as we I explained to you, when we publish, if we don't pass in any option, we publish as our default uh, PRID. Our key pair is our default PRID, and we publish as our default PRID. So we will show up, hopefully, in this side on the dashboard if everything goes wrong. So I'm going to try. I'm maybe I'm already there. No, so okay. I'm gonna choose picture, just a little brown. I'm write the name. I'm gonna get the CID up here. Copy. Go down again. Paste it here. I'm gonna hide my name. Where I come from. And then I'm going to add to IPFS. As you can see, the JSON here is uh, the data we are adding to IPFS. And now we get the CID for that data. The CID we don't need to copy paste it anywhere. It just it's hooked up already. We just need to click the publish button. And then hopefully, if we manage to publish, let's take some time. See what is happening. Okay. Something wrong. Like values undefined. Sorry, what? Is value defined? Value? Oh, you oh you I, exactly. <laughs> Thank you again. So now, yeah, hopefully, it will work. We already see some of you there, hopefully. Again, if you have any questions to, to get to this point, raise your hand. We want to see all your avatars up there. Hopefully, on your computers too, alongside everyone else. So, do you need any help to get to this point? No? All groups managed to get. To this point, yeah. Yeah, but our gap is not showing up. So what? Our, our gap is not showing up on this page. Is this a weird demographic? 
You can think a, a little bit. Okay. You, do you manage to publish? Yeah. 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 Just wait a little bit, and it um, pulls up. Okay. Sometime. Oh, what? Okay. <laughs> we'll go back to the dashboard. And yeah, so if you have any questions right now, <laughs> nice one. Nice. I love the that. Cool. So if you have any questions, just we have some time now until we finish the, um, yeah, we have like 10, 15 minutes. Any questions, we are here to answer. So, how does the, I had a look at the Swarm uh, function. Can you tell us a bit about what's happening? How does the Swarm know our IP addresses? And uh, how the, you want to answer this one? So, I understand the question was uh, how do we get addresses of other views? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, basically, there's a command called Swarm. Peers, which returns a list of all the peers your node is connected to. And in this case, we did not call that, but if you look at the sources of uh, sample app, I did, I did find it. Oh, yeah, yeah. More, more info about how this yeah. one works. Yeah, so uh, the way we get those addresses is through that signaling server running in Jim's uh, house. Yeah, just keep spreading it. So, yeah. Just link sometimes. Uh, because in the web browser we don't have DHT yet, so we need to use a central, a semi-centralized uh, signaling service. Okay. Uh, what's cool of, uh, about this our implementation is that you can have multiple ones. For the purpose of this course, we are using just one. That gives us this nice dashboard only of the people who are here. Uh, otherwise, if we would use the publicly available ones or use multiple ones, we would get like random people from the internet. So we had like a small subset uh, just for uh, this dashboard to be more, to, to make it easier for your avatar to, to, to find it. Um, but you can have multiple ones and as long as at least one signaling server uh, works, you will be able to connect to, to the And in case if you are running like Go FS or uh, JSFS daemon, not in the browser but in Node, then you get uh, those views from DHT. You can also use signaling server, but if you have access to DHT, then you have like access to wider. Yeah. Any more questions? Can you use the key generation instead of your uh, your ID? Uh, is that just on memory or that it is actually stored somewhere that you can later uh, recover? Yes, it's source. Uh, and uh, in IPFS we have a, a thing called, uh, what we call the repo. Um, we have like several data sources for these different purposes. And one of them is to store uh, the keys and you, uh, when you want, you can you have other commands in the key namespace that allow you to export on, or import your own keys. So you have full control of um, the keys you have there. Uh, are these keys can be, any of these keys be used as for the, the peer ID or like there's very specific ones for the peer ID? Um, uh, Lila, um, do you know uh, how many uh, types of keys we support right now? We support uh, like I, at least two or three. Yeah, there are at least two. I think there's a RSA with this the default. Uh, yes. And we also support uh, elliptic curve one. Uh, you can change the type. When you when you generate a new key, you can pick a type. You can also pick, if it's a like RSA, you can pick how many bits, stuff like that. And, uh, again, all, both like CLEs, uh, multi hashes, and also uh, those keys uh, are constructed in a way that you can uh, switch in the future as new algorithms appear. You can 
Sorry. Transparently switch the new one, generate a new identity, and Pierce will automatically be able to use that without the need of change, uh, changing, changing code too much. It's like so, so describing Peer ID uh, that we could see on the screens. It was just multi hash, which had a prefix which was self describing. It told you what hash algorithm was used, and similar approach. Uh, for keys, uh, it's also in place. Yeah, but, but the keys, you get the keys there. There's no like multi formats. The stuff uh, like I was talking about is about like the other types of uh, representations, like string re representations, like Boolean adders. The keys itself, it, it's just the keys, the output of you, you are used to. You can after represent uh, like the PID, which is, uh, or the IPNS. Uh, uh, ID, which it's the hash of the public key, and that uh, with those were representations, we have we have um, a thing called multi-formats uh, that basically we call all, this, all all these types of information with a uh, specific in a specific way, so we can upgrade in the future when right? new stuff comes up. Any more questions? No. Okay, so I hope you liked it and we will wrap it up. Thank you guys.